during the panel, Andy Woodard said, uh, as goes the SBC, so goes the American church. And actually what he's pointing out is this principle that I want to articulate to you, which is how these Gnostic hermet and especially hermetic secret religions of the West operate. And that is the title of this talk within my three talk sequence of the secret religions of the West is as below, so above. As goes the Southern Baptist Convention, so goes the American church. As below, so above. And it turns out that that's actually a hermetic principle. So to make sense of how our secret religions of the West operate, we have to understand their basic framing of reality, their creation myths, their underlying mythology, but also the operation, because their religion is a religion of activity. It's not a religion of just belief. It's a, it's a, it's a religion of practice. So we have to understand how that works. We talked about negative theology. We talked about negating the real, but we haven't talked about the mechanism of their sorcery. I gave you a lot of stuff yesterday about examples of people who are are the ones who have the mind and the people who are excluded from the mind and how that justifies different treatment, um, parallel sets of principles. In other words, that they get to excuse themselves from their own evil. We read that directly out of the Corpus Hermeticum. Uh, they have a double standard that they erect for themselves. Why? Because they know, so they know better why they're doing an evil thing for a good outcome. And thus, it's uh, what Hegel actually referred to as something called the cunning of reason. The cunning of reason for Hegel was that good things come out of bad pe or people doing bad things. And in fact, Hegel believed that all thinking, because it's independent of the divine source, is intrinsically bad, believe it or not, as a philosopher. And it's by the cunning of reason that doing this bad thing leads to good outcomes. Uh, so he has this whole kind of strange, almost um, theodicy built into his theology. We already discussed the esoteric religion of Gnosticism, and I know Mr. O'Fallon just spoke about the religion of Gnosticism and probably <laughs> creeped you out big time uh, in terms of what it says. Uh, but we've only kind of touched on, I've said hermetic, hermetic, hermetic over again. I've read a little bit out of the Corpus Hermeticum, but we haven't talked in more depth about the hermetic religions yet. We haven't gone into detail. They are, in a word, dialectical. When we hear about the dialectic of Hegel or the dialectical materialism, the mechanism that they're referring to is the hermetic mode of action. The dialectic is hermetic thinking, which is alchemical thinking. It's how do you make something out of nothing. That's why you use negative to get more. It's how do you make gold out of lead? How do you make life out of death? How do you make the divine out of the mundane? And so, while Gnosticism mostly works by gaining the secret knowledge and lording it over people and framing it in different strange ways like Mr. O'Fallon just talked about, Hermeticism is a process. What I would say that when we get to Marx, and I'll say this again later, is that in a sense, Gnosticism is his motivation. Hermeticism is his process. And the fusion of those things together become very dangerous. So, what we're looking at historically over the modern era so the last few hundred years, is that in some sense, Hegel and Marx really success, successfully fused together Hermeticism and Gnosticism in a way that I don't think had happened before. Hegel's more Hermetic than he is Gnostic. Marx is probably more Gnostic than he is Hermetic. Marcuse, if we get kind of into the critical theorists of the middle of the 20th century, are, uh, is more Hermetic still. When I read One Dimensional Man again recently, I was struck overwhelmingly by how Hermetic the first and last chapters are of that book. What Hegel actually did was took Gnosticism and Hermeticism and hammered them together into one kind of coherent systematic thing he called a philosophy, or in fact a science. And because Hermeticism believes that all the religions are a reflection of the one secret true religion, which happens to be theirs, that it didn't matter which religion he framed it in. So he hammered Gnosticism and Hermeticism into Christianity and called it science. Marx flipped that over which you can say made, made it satanic, if you want, turned it very Gnostic, which you could also say is satanic, and called the process, or the, the result, scientific socialism. So he still hammered it into the frame of science, and in fact accused Hegel of being a theologian and a mysticist. And he was going to demystify Hegel's program. So as spiritual traditions, these 
Gnostic and Hermetic things, I, like I told you in the panel, am committed utterly to religious liberty. If somebody wants to go be a hermetic ascetic, they want to go live in a cave and meditate and achieve higher consciousness or whatever they think they're doing, more power to them. I don't like cults. I think that it gets very dangerous that they are very seductive in pulling people into cults. Adults are allowed to choose what they want to do and believe how they want to believe, and I suppose that's what it is. But when we're talking about this as a mostly an individual spiritual quest, while in a kind of Christian spiritual sense, it may be a very grave thing to be talking about because we might be talking about a lost soul. As From a perspective of religious freedom, I frankly don't care. I don't care if you want to be a New Age hippie. I don't care if you want to go meditate on an island until you die and think that you transcended and by your magical thoughts you saved humanity. I don't care as long as it's individualist. But when you start saying that it's your job to save humanity by getting all of humanity on board and it gets very collectivist, I start to care a lot. Weirdos, seekers, hippies. I'm not in with this. I don't, I don't like it, honestly. I don't want to be around it. But I don't mind that those people exist. Um, go meditate in a cave. Fine. But when it starts to generate cults, it becomes an issue. So especially when it starts to generate a world cult on the belief that unless everybody participates, then it's not going to work you have a really big problem. So when the belief starts to be that humans only ascend when all of humanity ascends, in other words, if it's collectivist, we're all going to heaven or none of us are. And that's a belief that falls out of this kind of look at hermeticism, especially when we get to Hegel and Marx, because their goal isn't to go to heaven, it's to make heaven here. It's to turn the world into heaven. So if everybody here doesn't play, it's not gonna work. Anybody here resists, it's not going to be the thing. That's where you start to have major problems. That's why an appeal to religious liberty has to be understood that that's what individuals get to do. There are individual rights and not such a thing as group rights. And of course, if you read in, say, the encyclopedias of social justice, they'll define for you that social justice is the interest in group rights as opposed to the interest in individual rights. When these start to cleave on to other faiths or poison sciences or things like that, I start to have an issue because you're taking something that is good and perverting it or subverting it. Lots of vert words, invert, subvert, pervert are happening here. It's true. So the heretical faith traditions that Mike was just talking about are an issue, and they're especially an issue for Christian leaders to be able to identify and prevent those heresies from gaining large followings and becoming offshoot cults that can be very dangerous, even with spiritual concerns set aside. When they start to try to become a totalizing world religion in particular, they get very concerning. What are some examples of totalizing, would-be totalizing, I should say, world religions? Nazism, communism or Marxism, the sustainable and inclusive future. How's it going to work if we don't all do it? It's totalizing. You have to totally rearrange your life, totally rearrange your behavior, totally rearrange your thoughts in line with the sustainable and inclusive future, or it won't work. And if you don't want to do it, they'll make you. Everybody thinks, you know, they, they come to a point where they think, well, communism believes that communism will work when everybody is a communist. But there, there's some subtext there they're not telling you. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to deal with that. We heard it from Hegel, is that you bend the objects to your will or you rage and destroy the objects that won't bend to your will. That's what Hegel said. So it's actually, the statement of communism is that communism will work when everyone who is still alive is a communist, which provides a pathway to a solution when everybody isn't going along. So technically, though, Gnosticism and Hermeticism are two different esoteric religions that got hammered together through the syncretism of the Middle Ages. They've brushed across each other. Hermeticism uses the concept of Gnosis, but is not the religion of Gnosticism. They're, they're actually different traditions. I have to bring this up partly because I want you to be clear, partly because I'm definitely going to get attacked and saying that I'm blending Hermeticism and Gnosticism into one thing, when it's actually that the concept of Gnosis, secret divine belief that you are the supreme, operates in both of them. It's a concept that operates in both things. The naming is unfortunate. Language isn't perfect. They actually have different creation stories, 
different dispositions toward the world, different goals. They have different entire mythologies. As a matter of fact, Hermeticism is a little thin on the mythology, and Gnosticism is all in on the mythology. Gnosticism is very likely to present itself as philosophy, and Hermeticism is not. They're very different in certain ways. But these, these different strains can take on different characteristics of either or both. And like I said, in the Middle Ages, it was a very syncretistic time in the esoteric religion phases. People were just mixing and matching. You see this today. I'll tell you about a guy named John Fetzer. I don't want to go off on a long tangent. John Fetzer ran a thing called the Fetzer Institute, which was devoted to New Age spirituality. John Fetzer was a multi-multi-millionaire, made tons of money working in radio. He ended up buying the Detroit Tigers and ran the team for many years. Um, you can see how well his hermetic principles worked. It's a famously great team. <laughs> Through the years, he owned it. Uh, John Fetzer was also a total New Age spiritualist or occultist. And his library is basically composed of every single wacky New Age hermetic, Gnostic, anything, anything esoteric he could find, he put it in his library. He commented and said, I believe some of it. I don't believe some of it. Some of it's good. Some of it seems downright evil. So the idea that you can take when you enter into these paths, take from this, take from that, take from the other thing, take from it, and mix it all together into the thing that works for you is exactly consistent with how this stuff thinks. So when we come through the Middle Ages to see somebody like Hegel picking pieces of it and cobbling it together into his German systematic philosophy is not a surprise. But again, like I mentioned, with hermetic stuff, this isn't at all a surprise because hermeticism is by definition syncretic. It mixes things together and adds them on, does cafeteria religion or cafeteria spirituality because it believes fundamentally that there's one true religion called the Prisca Theologia, one true belief, one true philosophy, the philosophy perennis, or Philosophia Perennis, the perennial philosophy. There's only one. And everything in the world, science, religion, whatever, philosophy is just a manifestation, a partial image of that total whole. It's like the shadow on the wall in Plato's cave, and the real object is casting the shadow. And so you can use whichever one you want. If you want to phrase it in Christian language, you can. Jewish language, you can. Islamic language, you can. Buddhist language, Hindu language, philosophical language, scientific language, it doesn't matter. They're all actually saying the same thing. You can mix them together. Hermeticism is, by definition, syncretistic. It believes there's one true faith, and you can think of it, like I said the other day, like a big diamond that's cut with a thousand faces, and every face is a religion or a philosophy or a scientific approach. And they actually, if you could get through the surface, are all the same thing. So all the particulars have to be understood in terms of the whole. That's the philosophy. And it does mix and match in the European milieu from the 15th to the 19th century and to this day very, very heavily did that. And it turns out that the Swabian region in Germany was the last to give it up in earnest. And that's the region where Hegel was born, raised, and educated. So there's a lot going on in the world today that we can make sense of when we understand these religions. I didn't find the video because they took it down. I wanted to show you a video, also I want to make this a little bit abbreviated. I don't know if you know that there was recently a, a drama that was produced and performed at Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Very prestigious. It was called I, Joan, and it was to retell the Joan of Arc story, but now the new Joan of Arc is non-binary. And it has this long monologue that they very proudly put on YouTube for about 18 hours till it got mocked so hard that they realized they messed up and took it down on the Globe Theater's site. And it starts off with a little, I think, under 18, so I want to be you know, sensitive to how I phrase things. I don't want to make fun of a minor too much. But this person that sounds like a girl that looks like Harry Potter comes out on stage and is, trans people are sacred. That's a key line in the new Joan of Arc telling. Trans people are sacred. And then there's this artsy-fartsy, you know, every word for a whole sentence ends in acridy or ality or something. The reality of the other ality that is the ality that makes the reality of the actuality. And this long sentence of just being silly. But all this stuff, and it was about six or seven minutes long, and it went viral, mega viral, and within a few hours they took it down, and it is hard to find now. 
I immediately sent a note, because I don't know how anything works, and I was like, somebody rip this video, download this video and save it. We need to show people this. Uh, they're gonna take it down, but unfortunately, the people that I work with that know how to use computers were on airplanes flying across the Atlantic at that moment and couldn't do it. But you will understand the declaration by the end of this lecture of trans people are sacred in a way that even the Gospel of Thomas didn't reveal to you uh, when Mike quoted from it a little bit ago, saying that Jesus was going to make the women male because by becoming male, every woman who becomes male, they can enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is not, into my knowledge, in the real Bible. I might have skipped a book or two, I don't know. So there's this book that I found quite by accident that's been very helpful in understanding Gnosticism and Hermeticism for me over the last few months. It's by two Dutch scholars, which means I'm not going to say their names right, but it's Roel, I guess, R-O-E-L, Roel Vanderbroek and Walter Hanegraaff. And the book is called Gnosis and Hermeticism from Antiquity to Modern Times. It's a rare exception in the scholarly literature where they've taken the time to write about these things because, like I said, scholars tend to think you're a weirdo. You might as well be studying ESP or mesmerism or something like this if you get into it. And in their preface to this book, I'm going to read a little bit from this book to you kind of in longer chunks to give you a feel for what Gnosticism and Hermeticism are. They say it's, this will validate everything I've said before, by the way. It's still often regarded as self-evident that Western culture is based on the twin pillars of Greek rationality on the one hand and biblical faith on the other, Athens and Jerusalem. Certainly, there can be little doubt that these two traditions have been dominant forces in cultural development. The former may be defined by its sole reliance on the rationality of the mind, the latter by its emphasis on an authoritative divine revelation, so scripture. However, from the first centuries to the present day, there has also existed a third current, the secret religions of the West, right? What's it characterized by? They say it's characterized by a resistance to the dominance of either pure rationality or doctrinal faith. I've characterized it as a parasite, of course, on these. The adherents of this tradition emphasized the importance of inner enlightenment or gnosis, a revelatory experience that mostly entailed an encounter with one's true self, as well as with the ground of being, God. So an encounter with God and thus also your true self. In antiquity, this perspective was represented by Gnostics and Hermeticists, in the Middle Ages by several Christian sects. The Cathars can, at least to a certain extent, be considered part of the same spiritual tradition. Starting with the Italian Renaissance of the late 15th century, the newly discovered Hermetic philosophy, that's in quotes, rapidly spread all over Europe. It found many adherents, in particular during the 16th and the first half of the 17th century. The so-called Hermeticist tradition and its later developments, we're going to stop my popping. I don't know how these things work. Give me a handheld. I'm old school. Thank you. Sorry, where was I? This so-called Hermeticist tradition and its later developments, the whole of which may be referred to as Western esotericism. So none of this stuff, I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't name all this stuff. These aren't my words. We don't get to, some of them have been, but we don't get to say that I coined Gnosticism or Hermeticism or any of this stuff. Was characterized by an organic view of the world that assumed a strong internal coherence of the whole universe, including an intimate relationship between both its spiritual and material elements. So that's what they characterize as the esoteric religious traditions. I wanted to tell you that because it's absolutely clear that there have been three currents in Western philosophical slash religious thought going on for all of Western history, and we've only recognized two of them. They go on to give a charming endorsement of what these gnosis-based approaches are about, or the hermetic approaches are about, and they reach back and quote, quote, Plotinus. You will find this relatable if you've ever talked to a woke person or seen a woke person. They say Plotinus makes it completely clear that Gnosticism is something quite different from philosophy. His Gnostics were interested in philosophy, but they proved themselves to be charlatans since their claims were not based on solid philosophical reasoning. Remember yesterday I said instead of reason, they have the snake eating its own tail. Circular reasoning. He wrote indignantly in Aeneid's 2.9.6, quote, this is Plotinus, this is what you're going to find relatable. 
If they, wish to agree, if, if they wish to disagree on these points, there is no unfair hostility in saying to them that they should not recommend their own opinions to their audience by ridiculing and insulting the Greeks, but that they should show the correctness of their own merits of all the points of doctrine which are peculiar to them and differ from the views of the Greeks. See, they get up on stage and instead of making a case for their thing, they make fun of the other side. That's all they do. They should state their real opinions courteously as befits philosophers and fairly on the points where they are opposed, looking to the truth and not hunting fame by censuring men who have been judged good from ancient times by men of worth and saying that they themselves are better than the Greeks. That's his criticism of Gnostics. But that's what it's like to try to talk to a woke person or to a Marxist. With the, uh, the authors of the book was, are Dutch, and I'm not going to do that again. With respect to the numerous hypostases introduced by the Gnostics on the basis of their revelations, Plotinus observed with some bitterness in the same section, listen to this, you've dealt with the woke. Plotinus said, by, and by giving names to a multitude of intelligible realities, they think they will appear to have discovered the exact truth. Though by this very multiplicity, they bring the intelligible nature into the likeness of the sense world, the inferior world. They create hyper-realities that look like reality and claim they've discovered the real truth that they know and you don't. And that's the justification for everything they do. So all the way back, 2,000 years, we have the same complaint about the same people doing the same BS. So according to Plotinus, they tell us, the Gnostics were not philosophers at all, and he was right. Gnosticism is not even a depraved form of philosophy, or theology as a matter of fact. It is something quite different. Though the Gnostic writers often made use of philosophical ideas. That's the parasite function. So, like we said, there are three, this is hard, because there are three concepts that are called Gnostic. There's the little g, which is this disposition, that you know secret revealed knowledge that happens to be that you're God and what the world is supposed to look like. Then there's a capital G, which refers to when the Christian sects picked those up, and that's what Mike talked about earlier with you in his talk. And then there's this, I guess, extra big G or whatever, which is the Gnostic religion itself, which parasitized its way into Christianity to create those Gnostic cults, which is this belief that the creation was a mistake. It was done by an evil demiurge, etc. So in Vanderbrook and Hanegraaff's words, they describe it this way. They say, in the following, I shall use the term Gnosticism, that's with a capital G, by the way, to indicate the ideas or coherent systems that are characterized by an absolutely negative view of the visible world and its creator and the assumption of a divine spark in man, his inner self, which had become enclosed within the material body as the result of a tragic event in the precosmic world from which it can only escape to its divine origin by means of saving Gnosis. That's Gnosticism. That's what I am saying, to put my cards clearly on the table, is running behind the secret religions of the West. That's what's running behind the social justice movement, the communist movement, the sustainable and inclusive future movement, the 17 sustainability goals. And notice that it says that Gnosticism's disposition is wholly negative to the world, to the body, to being itself, and it was the result of a tragic accident in the pre-cosmic world. It regards being itself as a prison and the creator as an evil demon that jailed us in that prison. It's the demiurge that we think is God, that we've been fooled into believing is God, that actually creates the world so as to imprison us to keep us out of our true spiritual nature. Salvation arrives Firstly, through knowing this secret truth, which lacks something important, which is a practice. So various sects, Christian and otherwise, came up with different ways to, to, to try to attach a practice to this. But it also cobbled straight into Hermeticism, which gives it a practice very, very neatly. Because they use the same mental architecture with very different dispositions. The idea behind Gnosticism in general is that man is actually divine, but has had it imposed upon him that he is not, so he is estranged from his true being. He's alienated from who he is, and in Marx's word is given an alien being, a God, that he thinks justifies that. It has a creation myth that 
tells this whole tragic cosmic accident. It's a bit wild. The rough, rough, short, short version is that it posits that the world was created by accident and an evil being called a demiurge was the one that created the world. That arose because God exists in this fullness of godness, which is called the pleroma. It's the, what we might call heaven, I guess, he, in this transcendent plane, the true God. And when anything happens there in thought, it happens there for real. That's the principle of the pleroma. So God had a first thought. That thought manifested and it split into two forms, one male and one female. The male was called Logos. The female was called Sophia or Wisdom. Wisdom herself or philosophy herself, as Hegel might have had it, thought that she also wanted to create, which is intrinsically a sin. And therefore... Because she thought it in the pleroma, it manifested, and it manifested in a creator that is intrinsically evil because it is the birth of the sin. And that's the demiurge. And the demiurge caused the material world to come into existence as it is, and it trapped man's soul, his nose, inside of the material body, the fallen body, and placed it into a fallen material world of suffering. And then works... To keep him trapped there. You hear that when we reinterpret Genesis as that the snake was telling the truth to try to do a jailbreak, which is the heart of what we might call Gnostic Satanism or Luciferianism. So this makes man a stranger and an alien in a hostile world, and in fact, a stranger and an alien in his own body. You're a spiritual creature stuck with this crappy piece of wetware. You lose track of your true spiritual nature because you have animal and bodily urges. You have to go to the bathroom. You have to eat. You have to drink. You have to procreate. You have to stay warm. You get cold or hot either way. You have all these things to attend to in the material world, and you have pain, and it's miserable, and you forget that you're actually not just a spiritual being, but actually a piece carved off of the soul of the all. And so you become trapped and enslaved in the fallen world and to your fallen body, to your lower emotions, to your desires, to your passions, to physicality itself, and you lose track. You can hear how this is a perversion of true spiritual teachings. What we read uh, from Vanderbrook and Hanegraaff, against this background, the famous definition of gnosis by Theodotus, a second century Christian Gnostic, becomes perfectly clear. Gnosis is the knowledge of who we were and what we have become, where we were and into what we have been thrown, whither we hasten and from what we are redeemed, what is birth and what is rebirth. That's what Gnostics actually believe. We know who we really are and what we've been thrown into, and we know what it means to be reborn into that. So Gnosis, or the goal of Gnosticism is to use Gnosis, knowledge of how the world really, really is and is kept secret from you by them, to get back to the unknowable God, to escape the prison of being. Heidegger, in his famous concept of the flungness of being or thrownness of being, depending on the translation of Geworfenheit, I guess I said that wrong, it's Geworfenheit, kind of characterizes what this is. We've been thrown into a world and into a body we didn't choose. We didn't ask to be born. How miserable, how miserable in life everything is. So Gnosticism is inherently pessimistic about everything, which is not how Hermeticism is. There's a lot more that could be said. Mike covered the Gnostic Christian cults a little bit. That's a whole long, long, long series of lectures that I can't even give, so I'm not getting into that rabbit hole, but there are lots of different Gnostic sects and cults. The Valentinians are probably most famous. The Sethians are very significant. The Manichians are very significant. They go on and on. Hermeticism is different. It uses gnosis, kind of like we just heard, but it's absolutely opposite in disposition. It does not think that creation is evil into prison so much. Gnosticism, more practically speaking, gets very mythological. Hermeticism barely touches it. It's more like this kind of abstract, new-agey-sounding teaching. You heard a little bit from the Corpus Hermeticum last night. 
We'll hear some more soon. Gnosticism hates the world and being, and Hermeticism doesn't. Gnosticism sees life and being as a prison. Hermeticism, Hermeticism sees it not as a prison to escape so much as something that we must transcend and that we're given the opportunity to transcend. You start talking about this multiple lives stuff, and we start thinking about that. Oh, I learned these lessons in this life. I'm going to learn these lessons in the next life, and eventually my soul will be ready to ascend. That's the kind of thought. The dialectic, the removal of, of opposites, or really understanding that opposites are the same in kind but different in degree. They're the two aspects of the same thing. The dialectic is hermetic. So I mentioned in the panel the other day when Charlie Kirk says that the Bible is a book of distinctions and therefore it's a good guide to life. What he's also saying is that reality is a reality of distinctions. And that when we understand distinctions, we become wise, we become discerning. So he says that the book from the very beginning is about good and evil, male and female, faithful and doubting. And all throughout, you see that. Returning and coming, uh, falling away, these whole things. Faithfulness and betrayal, all of these very stark themes of distinction. That makes it a good guide for life because it's a book about how important distinctions are to gaining wisdom and perspective, and therefore uh, it works to understand a reality that is discernible through distinctions. So Hermeticism is directly opposed to that. Its goal is to bring everything back to oneness with no distinctions, at one mint, like we talked about last night, in place of atonement. Atoning means to return to the whole, at one mint. It uses a dialectic so that all opposition is obliterated. It's said to be the seen, it's seen to be the same as from a higher view. It's that, oh, you think that this thing and that thing's different, but if we go up on a hill and look down at it, you see they're two pieces of the same thing. You think that the river and the, the, the land are different, but when you get up on the hill, you see they're part of the landscape or some word game. We talked about Hegel doing this with apples. This apple and that apple are both apples. And we can only understand that by going to the divine concept of appleness, which we can only understand by going to the divine concept of fruit, which we can only go to the, understand by going to the divine concept of food or whatever. We just keep going up the category until we get rid of all categories. We heard it with the idea more practically with my kind of joking critical car theory, which is identical to critical race theory, that anything bad that happens in traffic is the fault not of the driver who made a mistake, or whatever, but specifically of the entire system that validates using cars at all. So every one of us is complicit in upholding the use of cars, so we're all complicit in every traffic death. In some sense, that makes us all murderers. You can see how their language would just start running this way, but not them when they do it because they know why they're driving. They get to fly their private jets in the environment because they're flying their jets to solve the environmental problem, which they know how to do and you don't, which is why they don't see it as a hypocrisy when you point it out. They get to eat the best food and meat and everything else because their brain has to be nourished. Yours doesn't. Because they know what to do with theirs and you don't. That's what this is actually about. When we talk about postmodernism, as Mike Young, Local Distance did, we hear the postmodern blurring of boundaries or the woke blurring of boundaries. I referenced, in fact, the concept talking to Charlie that in queer theory, they call categorization itself a form of violence. If I say you're a girl, I've categorized you and that's violence I've done to you. Because what if you don't feel that way? What if you've had contact with your true self and don't feel that way? I've done a violence to you by gaslighting you about your real existence, even though I've actually described your real existence to you. So for them, the mind becomes primary. What you imagine is real is actually real, and what is in the world is in the way. So it must be transformed or destroyed to get it out of the way. That's the ethos behind these secret religions. Now, Hermeticism gets weird. We heard that quote last night, and I dwelt on it a little bit, where I talked about what evils you're going to give up, and he said, seven, on the first plane you'll do this, and the second that, and it goes up to the seventh plane you'll do this, then you enter the eighth plane and the ninth plane and all this, right? These planes of existence. And there are at least nine. The Emerald Tablet has a section talking about breaking free from the seven and going into the eighth and ninth spheres of existence, and your goal, therefore, in Hermeticism is to ascend through the planes. The lowest plane, they say there are seven in the material world, the lowest plane is Mineral, the next one above it, 
is vegetable. The next one above that is animal. The next one above that is human. That's where we are. You are here. The next one above that we're supposed to go to is etheric. The one above that is astral. The one above that is spirit. So what's Hegel's philosophy? The return to spirit. It's to ascend to the top of the bottom plane, at which point you can then go from seven to eight and from eight to nine. And we'll get to what those are in a second. Because I want to make a real quick point. We are at human. We are at the great reset to transform the world to something new. And it's the etheric plane in their philosophy. So I'm just going to ask you where their goal is. Where are we all supposed to move? Well, you're supposed to go live in a toilet, first of all, and plug into the internet. You get into the metaverse, right? That's your etheric plane. Not to sound too wacky and conspiratorial, but what is the cord called when you actually physically plug your computer into the internet? It's an ethernet cable. The etheric plane is the one in which the body becomes much less relevant. The astral plane is the one where the body can be left behind entirely. That's when you fully live, when they fully upload your consciousness, if they had their way. They think they're going to digitally simulate the etheric and astral planes, mere simulacrity. And when that becomes unnecessary and we finally become one internet of brains, we enter into a return to spirit. We make whole humanity again. We're one organic whole sharing thoughts through internet connections wired directly to our head. That's a way of interpreting what we're looking at. What they consider that to be is this, this, these seven layers are the, 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 the third person of their Godhead. We talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and I told you before, they think about God, mind, man, or God, mind, world. Nature, or man, or world are considered to be the begotten form of God. You are God, and you're supposed to remember that because you are the begotten God. So the plane above number seven, the eighth, is the self-begotten plane. And the belief is that when you reach the level of spiritual ascension to where you can self-beget, you make yourself in your own image, then you are at the precipice of being able to reabsorb into the whole. The ninth plane is the unbegotten plane, the pleroma. So your goal is to continually Raise yourself up through these levels until you leave behind your body. We heard that in the Hermeticum last night. You leave behind all of your vices mentally and emotionally. You leave behind eventually any connection to reality and beget yourself spiritually as you were meant to be in the, image of, or in the mind of God, which you have seen the image of. The mind of God is on that eighth plane. That's where Christ lives. It's the highest level man can attain spiritually in his life, and Christ was just a guy who got there. See how they absorb your religion into theirs? He's just one guy who did really good and actually got there. So you understand a lot about Christianity, and you think you know everything. You don't know anything. He's just one guy. Lots of guys have done it. You can do it. In fact, it's your duty to do it. Man is made or begotten in that image. And so you are God, and you've in some sense forgotten it, and your job is to recollect it or remember it or to remove all the distinctions that cause you not to be able to see it. Man is therefore not just God, but he has to become his own Christ, at which point he can return to God, to the one, to the all. And of course, that happens by removing all distinctions from everybody. This is exactly the architecture that Hegel hammered into his idea, nature, state, society, and then Geist, his new trinity that isn't but becomes. It is the truth of its own becoming. It is the circle that presupposes its beginning at its end or whatever that was. This is also literally how Marx's creation myth goes. If we see it as that the goal is to raise yourself up to the correct understanding, to the gnosis, in order to merge yourself back with the mind of God and self-beget. You've probably never heard Marx's creation myth. It's in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts. This is almost two pages of Marx. It's worth reading in full. Bear with me. 
You'll hear the hermeticism. You can tell the Gnosticism that we've just covered. But you're also going to hear that Marx couldn't quite answer the fundamental theological question of creation very well and got a little upset. <laughs> we might call it, we might say that he rage tweeted this. <laughs> So he's talking about the IDs, he's pretending he's having a conversation, just to give you a little stage setting, and somebody says, yeah, well, where did you come from? Well, your parents, and where do they come from? Their parents, and where do they come from? Their parents. So you get the idea of the infinite regression, right? So you know what we're, we're talking about. He says, now, it's certainly easy to say to the single individual what Aristotle has already said. So notice he's trying to cast down Aristotle here. That's very important said, you've been begotten by your father and your mother. Therefore, in you, the mating of two human beings, a species act of human beings, notice how he's turned it collective, has produced the human being. You see, therefore, that even physically man owes his existence to man, not God. So then you're going to get to the infinite regression, right? How do you resolve that? Watch, he's going to flip out. Therefore, you must not only keep sight of, one as of the one aspect, the infinite progression which leads you to in further inquire, who begot my father, who is his grandfather, etc. You must also hold on to the circular movement, sensuously perceptible in that progress, by which man repeats himself in procreation. Man thus always remaining the subject. No, 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 don't answer the question. Look back at man. You will reply, however... I grant you this circular movement, now grant me the progress which drives me even further until I ask who begot the first man and nature as a whole. Marx does a good job with this question. I can only answer you. Your question is itself a product of abstraction. Ask yourself how you arrived at that question. Ask yourself whether your question is not posed from a standpoint to which I cannot reply because it is wrongly put. Ask yourself whether that progress as such exists for a reasonable mind. See, you're so stupid. Why'd you even ask that question? The question was badly posed. How many new atheists said that? Now I say to you, check this out. When I first read this, I, was, I read it quoted just from what happens here. And I was like, no way he actually wrote that. Now I say to you, oh, sorry, I skipped a part. When you ask about the creation of nature and man, you are abstracting. And in so doing, from man and nature, you postulate them as non-existent, and yet you want me to prove them to you as existing. Now I say to you, give up your abstraction, and you will also give up your question. Or if you want to hold on to your abstraction, then be consistent. And if you think of man and nature as non-existent, then think of yourself as non-existent and ask your abstract. Uh, sorry. Think of yourself as non-existent, for you too are surely nature and man. Don't think. Don't ask me. For as soon as you think and ask, your abstraction from the existence of nature and man has no meaning. Or are you, are you such an egotist that you conceive of everything as nothing and yet want yourself to exist? His answer was to not answer the question, flip out, and insult the person asking. That's how he sets up his creation story. His answer to where did the first man in nature come from? You ask him, well, okay, this is great. Man came from man. Yeah, my parents are people too. I get it. Where did the first person come from? Flip out insult. You know that you're dealing with a charlatan when this happens. I call this the iron law of woke overreaction. Give up your question. Just don't ask me. Aren't you egotistical? You can reply, he goes on, I don't want to postulate the nothingness of nature, etc. I ask you about its genesis. Where did it come from? Just as I ask the anatomist about the formations of bones and so on. But since for the socialist man, and now we get Marx's creation story. But since for the socialist man, the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor. Oh, man is what is made by man doing man things. Nothing but the emergence of nature for man. So he has the visible, irrefutable tr proof of his birth through himself, of his genesis. Since the real existence of man and nature has become evident in practice through sense experience, because man has thus become evident for man as the being of nature, and nature for man is the being of man. And this a lot of words. The question about an alien being, that's God, about a being above nature and man, a question which implies the admission of the unreality of nature and man, has become impossible in practice. Again, don't know. Let me just write a paragraph of anger that says, I don't know. 
I can't answer that question. So atheism, he says, as the denial of this unreality has no longer any meaning, for atheism is a negation of God and postulates the existence of man through this negation. So man came from negating God, at least in atheism. But he says it has no more meaning because there's something better. But socialism, as socialism, no longer stands in any need of such a mediation. See, again, I don't have to answer your question. We have socialism. That's what he says. It proceeds from the theoretically and practically sensuous consciousness of man and of nature as the essence. More wacky philosophy words to not answer the question, but the essence is the essence of being. It just is. It's the nature of the primordial being, and that's located in socialism. Because remember, creating was a species act in the last paragraph before he flipped out. Socialism is man's positive self-consciousness. No longer mediated through the abolition of religion, just as real life is man's positive reality. No longer mediated through the abolition of private property, through communism. Communism is the position as the negation of the negation. It is hence the actual phase necessary for the next stage of historical development. In the process of human emancipation and rehabilitation, returning to what you were supposed to be all along. Communism is a necessary form and the dynamic principle of the immediate future, but communism as such is not the goal of human development, the form of human society. So what he's saying is that <laughs> socialism means that we don't have to answer that question. Man is what man made by doing labor, and labor estranged man from himself, so it was being doing, been done wrong. So when we get back to socialism, we actually have what created man in the first place. Man was originally a socialist, and it's not our job to figure out where that came from. It's our job to get back to it. That's Marx's creation myth. Socialism created man. The demiurge of the bourgeoisie stepped in, divided labor, divided property, and estranged man from himself. And our job is to overcome or positively transcend that self-estrangement so that we can return to our species life and be communists. And that's just the next stage it's not the goal. It's not the end goal. It's the next stage in the process of human development. That's when we start to self-beget society, but the end stage is that we don't need society at all. So now we've pegged Marx that he's definitely hermetic and he's definitely Gnostic, and his goal with communism is a hermetic awakening of God or reawakening of God, which he locates in communist man. His God is filtered, the way that he talks about religion and God is filtered through Gnosticism. So the thing is, though, it's not that it's the real God. It's the fake God that's imprisoning us. So that re requires ruthless criticism of the false God, which he derived from Goethe's characterization of Mephistopheles, which happens to be the voice of Satan, which is all that exists deserves to perish. Why? So we can get rid of all of the nasty fallen material world and transcend above it. The true God will be reached, whatever it's, what is meant by that by, by Marx, by destroying the false God and all of his false creation, including his false creation of man and all material. Since Marx was like a super materialist in multiple ways, society takes the place of God. And like I said, the bourgeois class becomes the demiurge, the false god that has to be cast down, and the society created, the bourgeois society created by the bourgeoisie has to be destroyed utterly, and bourgeois man has to be destroyed utterly, transformed or eliminated. That's what Hegel said. That's what Marx did. True society, which is his stand-in for God, which was socialism, will be reached when existing society is destroyed. And we will, have reached, we, have, we will have arrived at that point at level seven, the spirit, from which we can go to the level of communism, the self-begetting, at which point that's not the final goal we can reabsorb into the true cosmic whole above it that Marx says doesn't even exist. So the end point of Marx's return to God is a return to nothing. It's a little bit of an inconsistent but positively destructive philosophy in that regard once you see it as a hermetic construction. Man with nose, if you will, is that being when he's awakened, when he has consciousness, class consciousness, socialist consciousness, when he becomes social man or socialist man, 
Socialism is the consciousness. It's your orientation toward the world and how we live in it. So when you arrive at a socialist belief, you've entered into nos with everything that comes with that. You can't really do evil if it's on the behalf of the greater good. You get to excuse yourself from evil. That's from the Corpus Hermeticum. You know better than everybody, so you have the right to rule, and they don't. You have the right to raise other people's kids. You instantiate that for people like Marx in an object of human society called the state, which has to become ruthlessly tyrannical and fully totalizing so that everybody gets on board because it doesn't work otherwise. Socialism, when man and society are truly social, is gnosis. Communism is when that reaches its pinnacle and negates itself. Communism becomes the negation of the negation. The negation of the existing society is socialism, and the negation of the negation when it ascends to a higher spiritual plane is communism. That's when, when that finally ripens as a full positive transcendence of all private property, and we're truly self-begetting and truly as social man, as species being, then it becomes God or reabsorbs into God and the world, in Marx's view, becomes the kingdom. Man, through social society, becomes his own savior, which gets placed in the power of the state. The state eventually withers away. It's self-sacrificial. It begets its own society and then or itself, and then sacrifices itself for the liberation and emancipation and rehabilitation of man. How people have avoided seeing this as religious for this long is one of the greatest tragedies and mysteries of our times. The state is the self-sacrificing savior of humanity. So what about hermetic creation? What's hermeticism? Let's back off of Marx. It occurs when the one or the all, which is overabundant, unbegotten, complete, total, etc., all has been only described in negative terms, pours himself out into the limited and the finite. Because, he does this because as an undifferentiated whole, God, he cannot know himself, or in fact that he's God. He's missing one crucial piece of his totality, which is knowing that he is totality, because he has nothing to compare it to. So the process of the hermetic belief is that God completes himself by becoming not God, negating himself, and becoming concrete in his godness by remembering that he's actually everything which he has to do by stepping through the negative, by creating an opposite to himself, separating himself from himself, and realizing that that was fake in the first place. Being overabundant in all ways, and pouring so infinite, and pouring himself into the finite causes some problems. If I gave you a glass here and told you to pour an infinite amount of water into it, what would happen? Well, it depends on how hard you pour the water. It might spill over, it might blow the glass up. Problems occur. It's messy, there's spilling, there's breakage. As God pours himself out into material being, all kinds of things shatter. The material world encaptures pieces of God's soul. Everything becomes goodness trapped inside of badness, and a thinking being gets trapped inside of a mundane form with the divine gift of being able to find the divine spark inside of the mundane and thus release it and bring it back together to complete God. When man overcomes all distinctions and realizes that man has overcome all distinctions, God sees himself in man's mind, which has no distinction, so it's man singular and plural at the same time and realizes, oh, it was me all along, and he actualizes, and then there's no differentiation between anything, and we all go off together to the pleroma or to heaven. The technique of this is the dialectic, the mixture of opposites until you don't see them as opposites anymore. In other words, a form of deliberately confusing yourself, a form of deliberately sacrificing your discernment, so that you can get along with a bigger whole of people. And so the dialectic progresses. In particular, good and evil are blended in this. Evil achieves good. That's Hegel's cunning of reason. Tyranny achieves liberation. That's Marx and Lenin. That's literally Leninism. He said when the state reaches its pinnacle of power, that's the moment it will wither away because it's completely ruined everybody, brainwashed them, or killed everybody who dissents, and there's no need for a state to manage it anymore. 
Man is posited in this cosmogony as the unique being who has a divine soul and thus can identify and collect the gold of being that's been scattered by the spilling over of the undifferentiated whole into finite reality. It's man's job to go around through philosophy and theology and hermetic wizardry to find the divine by removing the distinctions that make things mundane. That will lead us to realize God. And like I said, when man realizes God, God realizes God, and we all get back together. Perfection follows. There's your utopia at the end of the rainbow. And if you wonder, does it sound a lot like alchemy? It's literally where alchemy comes from. We're going to get the gold out of the base metals. You're going to do something to lead, and it's going to turn into copper, and that's somehow going to turn to this, and you're going to end up with gold. That's how you get from death to life, or the elixir of life. This is what this is about. How does it work? What's Hermeticism's nuts and bolts? Hermeticism makes use of a number of key principles, is what it calls them. There is the law, and the law breaks into several principles. Everything must accord to the law. That's God's, the real secret God's law. Nothing can get away from it, but it has a number of principles in terms of its operation. There's a book that was published in 1908, allegedly by three initiates, although I think it was by a single person that maybe has been identified. It's called the Kabbalion. It supposedly describes the principles of Hermeticism in tremendous detail, allegedly by members of the cult. It might be fake. Nobody knows. There are places where it agrees very strongly with the Hermetic ancient texts and places where it veers from them. And being written in 1908, it keeps mentioning how modern science has achieved exactly what was written in the ancient text. So you see the parasitic action into science. Certainly some of these are listed in the Emerald Tablet and the Hermeticum and so on, these seven principles it gives. Principle number one is mentalism. All is mind, the universe is mental. It's all in your imagination. But really your imagination is just a tiny little image of God's imagination and all, it is, all that exists is God's imagination being active. All is mind, the universe is mental. The second rule is the one this talk is about it's the principle of correspondence. It's phrasing in total is, you maybe have heard this, as above, so below, as below, so above. So as above, so below, as below, so above. Oh, a snake eating its own tail. Vibration. Everything moves, everything vibrates. So nothing is ever still. Everything's changing all the time. That's where we get we were vibing. We got together for some drinks and everybody was vibing. Our vibes started to match each other. It's a principle of vibration. That's that language from New Age stuff. Principle of polarity. Everything is dual. Listen to this. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature but different in degree. All truths are half-truths. That's a doozy, isn't it? That's the dialectic. That's where it comes from. Rhythm, principle of rhythm. I didn't write the way they actually have it down, but it means the pendulum swings. It always swings. It always goes from one side to another, so that can be used. If you can make the pendulum swing, you can hit somebody with it. You can make the pendulum swing to create effects, and then you can change planes or orientations and dodge the backswing and then push it again to go do something in the world. And that's what they do. The second reality has to look like it's working in the first reality while dodging the accountability of the first reality. We're gonna cause all of these problems, all this frustration, whatever. J6 happens and they, oh, that's an insurrection. And they dodge the accountability and get to push it again. That's rhythm. Principle of cause and effect. I don't really want to focus on these a lot in detail. Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Gender. The seventh principle is gender. I was like, huh? Gender is in everything. Don't tell the trans lobby. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. I'm not even going to get into that. In fact, it's really weird you read it. I'm not exactly sure what it's talking about yet. There's a lot going on in these seven principles. They're not for this talk because this talk is about as below, so above, which is half of the, 
uh, principle of correspondence. Obviously with the dialectic, we're also talking about the principle of polarity, and with the action, reaction, or problem, reaction, solution, we're talking about the pendulum, or rhythm. Polarity is the basis of the dialectic. Rhythm is the basis of its operation. Correspondence is their key magic tool. Their magic works through the principle of correspondence. The hermetic principle of correspondence is sometimes in fancy pants new age crap called the law of attraction. When you get your vibes right using the principle of correspondence, other vibes will match up with you and you'll get what you want. If you get your vibes right that you're actually a rich person, the universe in turn, as below, so above, will vibrate as you being a rich person, and then it'll come back to you and you're a rich person. The law of attraction. Remember how huge that was? How faddish that was? How much that implanted into people's minds that maybe this is how things work? It's the principle of correspondence from hermeticism combined with the principle of vibration from hermeticism. It sounded new agey. It is. Again, the full statement of the principle of correspondence is as above, so below, as below, so above. I actually saw a guy on an airplane one time with that, he had a satanic symbol on the back of his hand and tattooed in a circle around it was as above, so below, as below, so above. Kind of funny, or not funny, I don't know. This is the Ouroboros. This is the snake eating its own tail. This image is their cross. It is their key religious icon. I don't know if we loaded the graphic finally, but if we did, put it up. If we didn't, don't. It can stay up the rest of the talk as long as I can see a clock. The Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, is their image. It's one of their key religious symbols. As Hegel called it, the circle that runs back into itself, presupposing the beginning as it reaches in the end. So we're focusing here on as below, so above, not the whole thing. Why? Because we're below. That's where the action is, or the activism is. Marx's big insight was to use the hermetic principle of correspondence from the below. Hegel was an idealist. He used it from the above. The goal, if you want to change the world, not merely to understand it, is to use it from below. He stood Hegel on his head. It's exactly what he said. He took his hermetic magic and turned it upside down. Not as above, so below. That's a consequence. Every effect has its cause. Every cause has its effect. No, 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 no. As below, so above. And then the above will change and the below will change. And that's where we live. So that's what matters. That's Marx's sole interesting insight in wizardry. <laughs> so as in society, so in man. That's a, as above, so below. As in man, so in society. As goes the SBC, so goes the American church. And as goes the American church, so goes the SBC. If you want it there, like Andy talked about earlier. If you want it straight from Marx, he had these concepts called praxis. That's activism. An inversion of praxis. That's consequences of activism, in a sense. Or society creates man. That's the inversion of praxis. You are socially conditioned by your society, and man creates society through his praxis or his activism. Man creates society, creates man, creates society, creates man, creates society, snake eating its own tail. Marx understood that if you want to change the world, you start at the tail of the snake. Why? Because the head will always chase the tail and then consume it, and then become it. And you can kind of grab the tail if you want to stick with the metaphor. But the trick is, do I have, yeah, the head and the tail are in the same place. They're actually the same place. So if you control one, you control all, but you get to control one, and the one in return controls you. If you move the tail, the head has to go where you've moved the tail because it consumes it. And then, it goes, it goes around, it whips the tail back around to the next place. If you picture the snake, instead of being a circle, is doing this as it goes up a staff or something, you get the picture of the two-dimensional dialectic, the spiraling through history, to the point where there's no distinction any longer. These are, again, all of these hermetic principles I just read, rhythm, polarity, vibration, um, and obviously correspondence. Opposites are the same, different in degree. 
Head and tail. Tail's on a lower level. The head is on an upper level. You get the kind of gist. The cause and effect principle. You cause a reaction, then you take advantage of the effect. So as below, so above is what is meant by praxis. Praxis is a fancy word that means as below, so above when we're in the Marxist hermetic faith. You transform the lower state of the world to cause a transformation in the higher state of the world. That reduce, induces a reciprocal change in the lower state, which actualizes it. And so you get back to the idea, not the real, the actual. The hyper-real becomes actual and replaces the real. Mere, mere simulacrity comes back again. The inversion of praxis is as above, so below, which is that your activism causes changes in society, and then society makes it a social construction that makes it real, or actually reifies it, which means that it's made to a seem real, even though it's not. And George Lukács complained about that in length in history and class consciousness, saying that that's what the bourgeoisie does. So, of course, the Gnostics have to take it over because they know how to do it better. The higher state that Marx and all these Marxists and the woke want is that they get to control, to push us to the higher state of understanding and being, which is a community or communism. And Marx is very, very, very clear that his system is a system of praxis. It is not an idealistic system. That's why he critiques Hegel so vigorously. It's a system of activity, of activism. Activism is required. You are not doing woke if you're not doing woke activism. It's a lifelong commitment to self-criticism and activism. Philosophers hitherto have sought to understand the world. The point is to change it. So just as a kind of an aside, what is the UNWEF's goal, the UN World Economic Forum's goal? What are they? They were going to reset the economy to a sustainable and inclusive future. And what's the shape of the economy? A circular economy. If I might swear in a church, an economy that eats its own shit or a snake that eats its own tail. It's an economy that is meant to operate off of its own waste. I don't have the video, you can go find it, of Bill Gates drinking a glass of water that was squeezed out of his own poop. Out of some gigantic machine. So this is where we find the relevance of hyperreality. You have to simulate to create. Fake it till you make it in Hermeticism. It's creation through simulation. You create the actual to replace the real. Creation, magic, through the principle of correspondence, which Marx understood, if you want to affect the world, you start at the tail. As below, so above, because as above, so below. You simulate the environment below to make it actual below through this process, through one turn of the full snake dialectic. It's funny that it's a snake doing the dialectic. Read your Genesis 3 and be, be, behold and beware. You're, you have to knowingly make a simulacrum of what you want the world to look like in order to make that become actual through magic, which in real life means tricking people and enforcing them eventually. Socialism is a simulation of communism. It's an enforced political economy which shares are adjusted so that citizens are made equal. Turns out to be the same definition of equity. And if you force socialism long enough, it becomes automatic and becomes communism. You simulate communism until it becomes reified and becomes communism. You simulate equity and eventually it becomes justice. You simulate a humanized, inclusive environment, a sustainable capitalism, a completed nature. You simulate that. You simulate it and it becomes the techno garden of Eden. You, sim you simulate environmentalism and you end up getting sustainability. You simulate socialist man through new Soviet man, party man, or through critical man, or through woke man. And you end up with socialist man on the other side who has nose, or new man, or absolute man. Or somebody will cut their genitals off in order to make themselves into what they think they're supposed to be. You turn them into a person who has acquired nose. What did Marx say about humans? It makes them special. Man is incomplete and he knows he's incomplete. And here's a process by which we can complete him. The last part I'm adding. Transhuman man. That's the lower. We start putting 
chips in our robots and cyborgs in our body, plug into the internet, gain 30 IQ points or whatever it is, what do we become? You simulate homo deus, God-man. We raise ourselves from the human plane to the etheric plane, four to five. Just one more step. Upload your consciousness fully, leave the world behind entirely, we go to six, the astral plane. Eventually that just becomes pure spirit when we all become one. But in simulation, we only become one in the metaverse. And that allows us to begin to properly self-beget as a species, at which point we get to become God. You simulate through this internet of brains or bodies or things or just the internet a world brain that will eventually manifest as God. You simulate a transitioned body that will eventually reify as a transitioned person. When does a person become a trans person? When does a trans woman become a woman? Never. But in hyper-reality and simulation, the trans person becomes trans when society accepts them as such. In hyper-reality, they are trans when everybody acknowledges their trans status. So they must repeat the slogan, trans women are women, trans women are women. It's a magic spell to invoke that through social reification which is a simulation that becomes actual through full acceptance of everybody sharing the same mind about that situation. In every single simulation, it just so happens that the simulation is rigged up so that it's to their advantage to operate within the simulation. Marx claims that this is demystifying reality, which is why I say the Iron Law of Woke Projection never misses. It is mystifying reality very profoundly mystifying it. Here's a concrete example from communism, from a CCP struggle session in a thought reform prison documented by Robert Lifton from a prisoner named Dr. Charles Vincent, who was imprisoned in the early 1950s and spoke with uh, Lifton almost immediately upon his, his uh, release from prison and exile from China. This is how Dr. Vincent explained his prison experience in a, in a communist struggle session prison. You have the feeling that you look to yourself on the people's side and that you are, you are a criminal. Not all of the time, but moments. You think that they're right. I did this. I am a criminal. If you doubt, you keep it to yourself because if you admit the doubt, you'll be struggled and lose the progress you have made. So they'll torture you if you don't psychologically torture you. They didn't usually beat people up much in the Chinese prisons. And lose the progress you have made. In this way, they built up a spy mentality. They built up a criminal then your invention becomes reality. You feel guilty because all of the time you have to look at yourself from the people standpoint, and the more deeply you go into the people standpoint, the more you recognize your crimes. Why do they, go to, why do they take your kid to school with critical race theory and tell them they're complicit in racism? Because eventually they'll believe they're a racist. They build up a racist out of imposing a simulation of racism. Why do they tell your kid that they're a transphobe? Same reason. Again and again and again. They induce you into their standpoint, their gnosis, at which point you recognize how your former self was fallen and evil, and you've joined the cult. Lifton goes on to describe what he calls ideological totalism in very telling terms. How do the wizards work? In some sense, if we accept that Chinese Communist Party prisons under Mao were a wizard's program. He gives eight different characteristics of ideological totalism. Milieu control. That's the wizard circle. Everything around you reinforces the belief. Mystical manipulation. That's his words. These are all Lifton's words. Mystical manipulation. Well, there's your as below, so above, as above, so below. Demand for purity. That's a big theme we didn't talk about in Hermeticism. You can only ascend if you're actually pure. We actually heard that in the Corpus Hermeticum, the seven lower planes, all of the impurities you have to give up before you reach the seventh. First one being your body. The cult of confession. We have to confess because you have fallen through yourself. His other word, the sacred science is impressed upon you. This was written in 1962. He said that ideological totalists impose a sacred science on you. 
a Wissenschaftlicher Socialismus, a scientific socialism, Vernunft, noetics, all of these funny words. How do you get there? Loading the language. Well, there's your word and thought magic. Controlling the dialogue, controlling the discourse, controlling the, the words, the meaning of words. Doctrine over person. That's your return to whole. We all become whole when we all have the same doctrine, the same mind. The doctrine is a simulation of the mind you're supposed to have after you're transformed. Indoctrinating you simulates your transformation, which is programming or reprogramming, thought reform, or brainwashing. And then finally, the dispensing of existence. In other words, the return to whole. The Gnostic jailbreak from the prison. Lifton, writing this in 1962, probably had no idea, I'm going out on a limb saying that, that he was describing the application of esoteric faith when he was describing Chinese thought reform prisons, but he was. And a lot of you probably have been struggled, the struggle session, I've gone through it. How does it work? They seize control of the psychological framing of you through struggle, through relentlessly criticizing you and forcing you to try to escape that pressure by criticizing yourself and apologizing and accepting their framing that you're a racist or a sexist or whatever awful thing. They negate your reality, the reality of who you actually are. Vincent said, Dr. Vincent in the prison said, that they annihilate you and you constantly feel the fear of annihilation. Then they impose a new interpretation of you into you, whether it's criminal or racist or transphobe or bourgeois, then they struggle you, psychologically abuse you, gaslight you, tell you they're helping you until you begin to accept it. And then they force you to accept it by confessing it. And they do it over and over and over by telling you your confessions weren't sincere enough. And when, you find, when they're finally convinced that you believe it, it becomes reified. Then they let you out of prison and kick you out of China. When you truly believe that you're a criminal against the people, you are one, and you've reformed, and you cooperatively become a communist or get kicked out of the country. That's how it works. All of those abuses at your workplace, at your kid's school, online, that's what they are. That's what they're for. That's how they work. It's hermetic magic. And the driver of all of this is the secret specific gnosis. The belief is that the bad image of uh, the divine mind or plan a bad copy has to be made manifest in simulation until society accepts that it's real and makes it real by everybody accepting it. In other words, by adopting it as a hyper-real counterfeit. Hyper-reality is the fully actualized image of what they imagine the divine mind has in, in store. This can only be enforced by tyranny, through manipulation, through control, through coercion, through exhortations, and other forms of abuse. In struggle, you don't conform and they help you to conform. And at the zenith of this, it becomes spontaneous, just like how socialism at its zenith becomes communism and the state withers away because the simulation becomes actual, not real. Reality is replaced by actuality. Finding contradictions between the simulation and what you're experiencing, the contradictions gives them the data they need to improve the simulation a little bit more. Marx is unambiguous. The divine state is communism. He said, or actually communism is the last stepping stone because man is a species being, a perfect socialist that transcends private property, which is human self-estrangement. Communism is the negation of the negation. The negation of the existing society is socialism and intentional destruction of the existing society. Communism is when it negates the negation and comes into reality or actual, I should say, actuality. Socialism becomes spontaneous at the peak of its syntheticness. The more you pretend, when you hit maximum pretending, it becomes real. And that's exactly, again, what Lenin said. The state withers exactly at the moment when it attains absolute power, not before. There is actually a math thing, so buckle up. There's this thing in math called a Fourier series. I never get to do this, so I'm going to put it on tape. Fourier series, turns out you can approximate virtually any curve within certain constraints. We're not going to get into the calculus details with a bunch of waves. It's called a Fourier series approximation when you only use, you know, however many, 10, 100, 1,000, or whatever. If you had all of them, it's called the Fourier series, all infinity waves, and you get the curve perfectly. If you put that in what's called polar coordinates, you don't have waves. A wave is just a circle. 
right? What's the sine wave, right? What is it? If you look at how high the dot is, as the dot goes around the outside of a circle, it's how high up the dot is, as long as the dot moves at a constant speed. So it turns out that if you go into polar coordinates, you can take any picture you want. It can be drawing a Hegel or whatever, and you can draw that picture by taking a circle, and then on the edge of the circle, you put another circle of a different size, maybe, or the same size, and on the edge of that circle, another circle, and another circle, and another circle, and another circle, and on the very last one, you put a stylus that draws the picture, and then you figure out how big the circles are, and how fast they rotate, and how many circles they are, and you just let the machine go. And there are videos of this, you can look it up and it'll draw almost any picture. Now, when you only have 10 circles, it does a pretty bad job. When you have 100 circles, it does an okay job. By the time you get to about two or 3,000 circles, which is a big computer job to calculate, it can draw something very recognizable and very accurate. This is the thing. What I actually think is going on with the simulating reality until it becomes actual, this communism program, is that they have a picture in their head of what the Garden of Eden looks like, completed man in nature and society. They think they know what it is because they've seen the mind of God and they're doing Fourier series approximations trying to draw it. And it's real junky at first, so millions of people die. But that teaches them where to put the next circle and how big to make it. And then millions more people die. And they say, whoops, well, at least we got another circle. So it was for the greater good. So it was really bad, but it wasn't evil. We escape evil because we learned to draw another circle. But the thing is, is that as this goes out further and further and further and further, it gets more and more and more computationally heavy until it becomes impossible to, comp to calculate or compute another term. So it's not going to work in practice. Also, their image that they're using is made up. This is actually a stupid kind of mathematical reason why it's not going to work, why communism can't work, if this is what they're really doing, is that they have an image they believe is an image of the per perfected world from God's mind, and they're going to draw it through successively better approximations that cost 20 million lives to get the next term. They're never going to get there. So millions of people die, we got a new circle, or the last circle was too big, change its size, or whatever, because they're trying to draw the kingdom of God with this that they've imagined in their head, but doing it in reality with real lives, and history uses people and then discards them for this purpose, as Hegel phrased it. Um, but it, to get the drawing right, to actually draw the kingdom, if they even had the right image in the first place, would require infinitely many terms, which is literally impossible. And to get a good approximation requires insane computational power that will always fall apart. So when we hear the economic arguments for why socialism can't work, because it can't solve the, pro the, the problem of distribution, because the market gives you information about who's buying and what they want and demand and all of this, not just, other th not just trading goods and services. It gives you lots of information, exchanges information as well. That's tapping into this same concept. It cannot work. Mathematically, if this is a correct understanding of what they're doing, even if they knew what the kingdom was supposed to look like, it cannot work. But our goal is not to get into these weeds. It's to understand Marxism, woke, sustainability, etc., as hermetic with Gnosticism, raging in the middle, Gnostic hate raging in the middle. We already did this kind of with Marx. You simulate socialism, you get communism properties in the way, so we have to abolish it. What about CRT? Critical race theory. Race is imposed by whites through whiteness. So that's kind of a demiurgic evil as above, so below. So what you have to do, that's the means of cultural production. We have to reverse that polarity. There's your principle of polarity and vibration. We have to reverse the polarity by adopting positive discourses of resistance, like black is beautiful, whiteness is terrible, abolish whiteness, be less white, adopt anti-racism to abolish whiteness as human self-estrangement. Anti-racism is as below, so above. It's actually nous, it's consciousness. And when you're an anti-racist, you can be as racist as you want and not get fired from your job because you're doing it the right way for the greater good because you get to escape the evil. And you impose racial equity to do this because racial equity will manifest eventually as racial justice. Racial justice becomes actual when whiteness is transcended entirely as a form of human self-estrangement through race. You do that by making it so that equity makes whiteness a liability. Whiteness happens to be inextricably tied to white people, so it's intrinsically racist, but it's not evil because the Gnostics get to escape evil. And what do you get to impose? An inversion of racism. Racism standing on its head. Anti-racism, get it? It's not not racist, 
It's anti-racist. We used to say reverse racist, but it turns out it's anti-racist. It's a racism that points in the anti-direction. What they call a positive discourse of resistance is hermetic self-begetting. You're seizing control of the means of your own production. First in simulacrum or simulation, later through social reification. And this is exactly how CRT operates, even if the people doing it don't understand it, because this is their operating system that they've adopted through this long chain of things that have hidden that it's an esoteric religion. This is even more visible in trans. The Gnostic interpretation and the Hermetic interpretation are slightly different. Gnostic is the motivation, Hermetic is the process. So what's a Gnostic interpretation of the body? It's a prison. You were born into it. You didn't ask to be born into it. You were flung into it, thrown into your being. And then some doctor, which is a bourgeois authority, came along and assigned you a sex at birth. And then social expectations of gender reified it and forced you to become the gender that the doctor said. What's your goal if you're a Gnostic? To know that that's not how it really works. And to escape the prison. How? You gain secret inner knowledge of your true gender or your gender soul, if you will. That's why they talk in such religious language about their gender. About their gender identity, I really should say. So gender becomes a social construction to be rejected and liberation follows. But that's not enough to make it go. You need the hermetic understanding of trans because that's the process. Your goal is to transform your own body, your body's as below. You transform your own body to change it as above in the spiritual, in the conceptual realm. You do so through speculative reflection upon your own true identity, which Disney probably taught you in some groomer movie, and then your teachers backed up for you, or your friends told you on TikTok because they said they wouldn't be your friend anymore unless you changed your pronouns or that you did because it escapes the pressure of having the wrong skin color that CRT made you hate yourself for. But the goal is to convince you that you've seen yourself as you are meant to be in the mind of God in terms of your sex and gender, and then you can actualize, not make real, but actualize your gender identity or your gender soul through crude physical manipulations. And when you force society to accept the crude material transformation, by saying it's transphobic not to, down to the point of saying you have to have sex with a trans person, regardless of whether or not you like that, regardless of whether or not you're straight or lesbian or whatever would make it not apply. And that you have to fight transphobia at every turn, including by accepting this. When you get society to accept it and to reify your gender through affirmative care, gender affirmation, then ta-da, you're a girl. The transition is actual, but not truly complete, when society fully reifies gender. But in a more deep level, in the hermetic levels, you are literally attempting to raise yourself to the level of the self-begotten. Literally, you are begetting yourself. What you're doing when you are going through the transition process is you're climbing through the planes of existence. Who am I materially as a human? I'm male and female. What about etherically? Well, I can imagine myself as an avatar. I can pretend. I can have a digital woman character that I pretend that I am. Then you leave the body behind entirely. I feel as though I am a woman internally, and eventually this becomes spiritual. Then you are on the seventh plane and can enter the eighth, which is the plane of self-begetting. How are you going to do that? Because you're trapped in your stupid body. You're going to transform your body as below so that it transforms as above. You reify your gender soul, who you believe you've seen in the mind of God as you were meant to be before a doctor imposed sex on you at birth, and your parents, your evil parents who you have to hate for this, reified it, made it real for you by calling you a boy or a girl or whatever all those years. So you modify the crude material realm to imitate who you see yourself as in the spiritual realm that you've convinced yourself is who you were meant to be. But because as below, so above is a magical principle, it works. At your etheric level, the soul level, you have arrived into yourself when you begin the process of transition, but it's always dissatisfying, so you always have to do more because it's not physically done. So your transition becomes its own becoming. 
It's an endless process of becoming, and thus more surgery and more drugs and more money for the pharmaceuticals, etc. More damage to yourself, more damage to your psychology, more damage to your family, which, of course, you have to cast those away anyway. And you are fully begotten when you are fully affirmed by everyone else in your transition. In other words, everybody on the planet has to agree to your delusion or it's not real. So you have to engage in relentless, cruel, savage activism to get everybody to for- force everybody to accept your delusion because that's what makes it real. And now we understand Harry Potter and I, Joan, coming out and saying, trans people are sacred. They are intentionally going through a hermetic rite of self-begetting transformation even though they don't know that's what they're doing to themselves. So they are completing aspects of humanity spiritually by transcending the fallen world of sex and division. Doing this in disability studies turns out to be very instructive as well. There are three models of disability. It's hard to do any of this without having a bunch of preamble. The individual model of disability, you're disabled. Whoops. It's your fault. It's your deal. It's your not fault. It's your problem. You have to fix it yourself. Deal with it yourself. There's a medical model. Well, maybe we can fix you. Maybe we can give you like crutches or a wheelchair or a hearing aid or fix your ears or fix your eyes. And then there's a social model, which is that society should make accommodations to help the disabled or the handicapped be able to have full access. All three models have validity in various ways, but all three can be taken to bad places. The full model of social social model of disability belief arrived in the early 1980s through Michael Oliver, who argued that society actually disables you by refusing to affirm you by making everything fully accommodating. That there's no, until if there's no differences for a disabled person or a fully abled person, society is the one holding you back. So society is what disables you. So society has to affirm your disability through full and perfect accommodation so that your disability becomes wholly irrelevant. This is again, as below, so above. You affirm your identity as a disabled person to force society to accommodate it. You see this actually with people who become what they call transabled. They disable themselves so that they can become transabled. They can become disabled. These people, I think, were a little too jealous of the Special Olympians. You see it with deaf culture and blind culture. These are things with capital D's and capital B's. And they say that it would be a deaf genocide to cure deafness because there'd be no deaf people and no deaf culture left. So it's a genocide, even though every single one of them is still alive and living a more effective life. They say the same thing about weight loss programs are a fat genocide and the slightly more silly fat study. I'm not kidding. So the goal is that you maintain and lean into your identity to beget yourself into it and then force social affirmation so that it makes it irrelevant and thus transform society around it and you. Ability gets transcended as a form of human self-estrangement. You could also do this by making up a new transhumanist man, an internet of brains, become etheric man with a world brain and eventually an AI god, and it's loaded into you and everybody else, and we're all god man, homo deus. Step one, get on the metaverse. (laughs) In generality, the goal is that you realize that you are the third person of the Godhead and become the second person of the Godhead, your own Christ, by getting the world to accept you as such. You have to convince everybody that you're Jesus in some wacky disability or trans or whatever race, bourgeois, class, religion. But it only works when everybody buys it. So it's a plural. We all have to transform ourselves together into the same undifferentiated mind of God. Differentiation is bad. The only way we can return to God is by getting rid of all differentiation, and that's your dialectic. That's what this whole program is. Tyranny through mystification. You must mystify yourself. You must confuse yourself about gender. Gender is socially constructed. Therefore, it can change. I am who I feel I am. Lean into your dysphoria. Lean into your self-dissociative issues. Feed them through affirmation and struggle. The only dysphoric problem that people have so far that people are encouraged by medical authorities to lean into is transition. I'm not saying gender dysphoria isn't real and tragic and serious. I'm saying that the medical system and the school system and the cultural system should not be affirming this. But you now know why they're affirming it. 
because we have to transform the society by beginning as below to transform, which in practice is tyranny to bully society to accept your terms, which are in many cases actually crazy in one way or another. We know what it looks like in Marxism. We have mystification through inversion of society. Marx's idea of alienation is that a bourgeois simulacrum is opposed from above, or that there's an alien being God that's controlling your reality that you have to cast down. This becomes structural reality. It's all through the means of production, so whoever seizes and controls the means of production gets to mystify reality the right way, and Marx just so happened to call his the only demystification of reality, the only true science. But man, through estranged labor becomes alien in his own world because he's living in a simulacrum created by the bourgeois demiurge that estranges. You have to overcome the estrangement, escape the prison. The dialectic is the process. It's the exact same. This is why trans or queer theory is queer Marxism. The goal is to make everybody start to believe this so they become activists who do the praxis, the as below, so above, so that it becomes the as above, so below, and the mere simulacrity becomes the simulation of the real that will actualize and displace the real, and we finally get to be in the pleroma, or heaven. This is how the secret religions of the West operate. Once you understand that these exist and that they operate this way, we can start to discern them and encounter them and defeat them, and if we don't, we can't. That's why this talk matters. What we're facing with the woke and the WEF and the whatever is the largest, most dangerous, most tyrannical cult startup in human history that seeks actually to finally take the step of abolishing and sublating, as they call it, humanity itself to transition us from the fourth plane to the fifth, the human to something above human as they see it, etheric, if you will. So now that you know much more about how all this works and you know what it all is, you know that Marxism is not an economic theory. You know that woke is not a social theory. You know that these are new age religions. They are esoteric religions. In fact, your new agers aren't even just goofs. They're duped into playing along in tremendous evil, as Christians have been keen to understand, but maybe couldn't put language to before. This is dangerous. We have decentralized initiate cults through the manipulations of language, loaning the language, as Lifton had it. That's how they recruit members. You become a member of the cult without even knowing you're a member of the cult, merely by knowing the lingo and accepting the framing that it carries with it. That makes you initiated. Then you help the other wokes. So the warning of this conference, we're going to finally close. The warning of this conference has been that we are constantly invited to live in different versions of a mere simulacrity, a simulacrum of science or a different simulacra of it, a simulacrum or various simulacra of Christianity or our other faiths that are slowly being tied together into one cohesive system they believe will complete man, nature, and society. When we live in the frame they produce, when we live in or accept or operate within and fail to discern one of these simulacra, we're in the wizard circle. And as Eric Vogelin correctly said, at that point, we are lost. So our goal has to be to escape the wizard circle and to help other people escape the wizard circle, which will cause the entire internet to say, haha, James just gave a talk on Gnosticism and how bad it is. And he said that it's, he said exactly the Gnostic thing that we're being imprisoned and we have to escape it. The Iron Law of Woke Projection never misses. They'll try to throw at me, but it's because the Iron Law of Woke, never, of woke Projection never misses. They've cast a wizard circle on us and if they can make you believe that it's not one, then you won't try to escape it. That's Marx's mystifying and demystifying trick all over. His alone is science. His alone is demystifying. The way to get out and to help others out is to learn to reject the framing. It's all a framing game. They control the linguistic framing through discourses and postmodernism, loading the language. They control the knowledge framing by deciding what knowledges count and what knowledges don't ways of knowing and other ways of knowing. They control the psychological framing through gaslighting us, through struggle sessions, through making you feel like you don't fit in or that you're a bad person, through whipping up tornadoes of shame and guilt and sucking you into them until you transform your psychology to be in line with their program. They control the moral framing by saying things like that the right wing is intrinsically bad or this is bad or you're associated with bad and guilt by association and you're a bad person if you're not going along with them. In fact, everybody's evil except them because their magic allows them to avoid evil while they intentionally do it. Rejecting the framing is breaking the circle and we call it red pilling. 
We have to red pill everybody that we can. You do that by getting them to see, if you will, if you think of the wizard circle as that bubble, there are cracks. There are places where the, where, the, where the image isn't quite right that they've cast. When they see the gap and they can see reality for a second, that's where a red pill goes. That's what gets them. It's very hard to induce in somebody, but when it happens, it's very easy to help them see what actually happened and help them break out of that framing. What this boils down to is having enough people to overturn their systems, to get good people in positions of power and office that will serve faithfully, and to uh, make it so that we aren't just going to trust the programs they're throwing on us. I was on a plane once talking to a guy, and he's like, yeah, they're electrifying everything in car industry and all, 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 changing all the roads and all. And then they, at the end, this is the worst news I ever got. This guy says this whole thing is sad about it. He's upset about it. I don't want to deal with it, da, 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 all this stuff. Very negative. And then he says, well, that's what they're doing. We just have to adapt to it. No, you don't. Do not adapt to what your abuser is giving you reject your abuser. And that mentality has to be brought to more and more and more people. We need a critical mass of people who won't go along, who will say no, and who will understand what's happening to them because then they can help other people and it becomes too heavy so that they must delegitimize themselves totally by force or give up. They've conjured a golem, if you will, to force a simulation of heaven onto us And our goal has to be to make that golem too heavy, too janky, too broken, too stupid to do anything but fall apart at the moment it tries to pull the trigger. That's what we have to do. We have to understand these things to do it. And if we do, we can win. And, Mike, we must win. Thank you. (laughs) 